Thank you. It's, it's a great honor and privilege to be here with you this morning. I got to try to get 30 years of experience in, in about 20 minutes talk, so we're gonna, we're gonna, I'm going to have to move. So I do want to thank the people that put me here. Um, one, Jesus Christ. I don't think we can have any success in life without a successor. Uh, he's mine. My wife, Colleen, for the amount of time she's put in. Uh, our three children, Justin and Ashley and Austin. Uh, both my sons played for me. Um, so that was, that was a gift that I always thank the Lord back for because I missed so much of their career. Both boys pitched uh, in a state championship game and their father wasn't there. So that still bothers me today. But God gave me the opportunity to coach them, Justin for four years with me, Austin for three, and he's currently signed a contract with the, with the Los Angeles Angels. But I always like to try to be honest anytime I speak, so if I look a little fidgety up here, I want you to know why. Uh, I got up this morning, drove uh, last night after practice, about seven hours into here, got here about three in the morning, we'll do these two talks today, and then head back for practice tomorrow morning. But we've been pretty busy. I got up this morning to pick up a shirt I wanted to wear. The button fell off. I went to get a different top I wanted. The zipper fell off. I went to get my briefcase to come here. The handle fell off. So I've been scared to go to the bathroom all morning. <laughs> I don't know what's going to fall off next. So if I look a little fidgety, that, that's why. I like to be honest to the people I speak with. But I'm really honored. I did get my 1,000th win. Uh, it did come at the cost of University of Alabama. But the, the, the class and the character of Coach Mitch Gaspar the next day <clears throat> giving me an autographed baseball with the Alabama logo. Uh, it sits on my shelf uh, in my office, and, and I proudly display it. The great respect I have for the state of Alabama, the coaches, the players. Uh, we have two kids that we just signed from your state, and we're recruiting a third. So uh, we're, we're, we got a lot of respect uh, for you guys here today. That's why I'm here to speak. The one thing I'm going to speak on today is a little different. I told Barry, I thank Bobby Pierce for putting me in touch with Barry. Our, our past cross and Matt Kennedy for, for getting this all set up. Uh, I've been teaching pitching for 30 years, uh, so I'm speaking later on pitching, but I asked them to do the talk that I think is more important than pitching for us to, to, to really get our arms around as coaches. Four years ago, we brought this to the, the in Waco to the Texas Baseball Coaches Association. From there, rumors spread. It went to Mississippi. The Mississippi Baseball Coaches Association asked me to come and do this presentation. We did it. It spread last year to Tennessee. We went on to Tennessee and spoke to the Tennessee Baseball Coaches Association. And this year it spread to the great state of Alabama. So I really appreciate you allowing me to do this. I'm going to get going. Uh, a baseball coach is what I do. It's not who I am. The biggest thing that gets us in trouble is what we do becomes who we are. It gets great coaches in trouble, wealthy people, movie stars, actors, anybody that hits success in their life. What gets us in trouble is what we do becomes who we are. I'm, I'm, I'm a baseball coach. That's what I do. That is not who I am. I can't allow what I do to become who I am. And this is what gets us in trouble and gets great players in trouble all the time. When our players check in, the first thing I ask them is if one, had they read the Bible, read it good, as I tell them, and you come back as a project and come back to me and show me in there where it says you have to be a baseball player. I've been coaching 30 years and no player has come back yet. One smart aleck came back one day though and said, Coach, I think there was baseball in the Bible. I said, well, how did you get that out of that? He said, well, Adam stole first, Eve stole second, God threw them both out. So he probably was a catcher. I said, I don't, I don't think that's what we're working on here, son. So, so you're not going to see a whole lot of baseball in the Bible. So we spend so much time today in our country because we glorify the athlete, we glorify <laughs> athletics today, that that's all we do. But the moral courage, leadership, is at an all-time low today in athletics. See, when a guy, when a, when a baseball player or an athlete gets himself in trouble, I'm telling you, next time you see it, and it's going to continue to happen. We had one just the other day punched his wife in the face, or his girlfriend in the face. See, that day when he punched her in the face, it wasn't his vertical jump that hurt him. It wasn't his ability to run the football. It was who he was as a man that failed him that day. Why? Because so many people along the way worked for him to make sure he was a good football player. But they didn't work on this side. See, I can take a player today in my sand pit, my, my bullpen, with a 400-pound tractor tire. He'll flip it in 100-degree heat for three hours to get a Major League Baseball contract. 
But later that night when he goes into his buddy's apartments and three dudes are smoking wacky weed and one guy got porn on the TV, he doesn't do nothing. He sits down when it's time to stand up. Now think about this for a minute. He'll flip a 400 pound tractor tire for an hour in 100 degree heat. Why? Because we glorify the athlete, we glorify their athletic courage. So it's through the roof. <coughs> the problem in today, we had an all time low in their moral courage. Because we don't work on that. Because society doesn't glorify that. We glorify the athlete. See, Tiger Woods at one time was the number one golfer in the world. And I'm not being disrespectful. He's the 288th one now in the world. His golf didn't get him in trouble. See, their sport will never get them in trouble. Who they are as a man is what's going to get them in trouble. If a player comes to me and doesn't sign a Major League Baseball contract, his career is over at 22 as a baseball player. If he lives to 82, he's got 60 years to live on who he is as a man. But yet, we're going to work so hard on trying to make him a good baseball player. This is why athletes will continue to be in trouble, is because nobody wants to work on this side. Well, if you play for us, we're going to work on that side. This is, I love this. It's a simulated thing. It's not a real tattoo on his arm. It says, God, humility. See, God says we can't get to any of the virtues in life until we're willing to walk through the door of humility. What's the biggest problem with a great athlete? What's the biggest problem with the star on your team? He's not humble, right? Because, because society tells him to go ahead and get him, him. Get, get everything coming to you that you deserve. But that's not a servant leader. That's not a guy that's going to be able to compete in corporate America down the road. He says this in all his testimonies that he gives. When he got out, he had $3 million. He was rich in cash, but he was bankrupt in Christ. Five-tooled player gets kicked out of Major League Baseball. Man, that's, that's not easy to do, to get kicked out of Major League Baseball and be a five-tooled player. <coughs> what got him kicked out? Wasn't his ability to run or throw or hit. Heck, he had five tools. What got him kicked out of baseball was who he was as a man. Why? Because we worked so hard on making him a baseball player, we forget about trying to make him a man. So he had to rearrange all his priorities and put God first, humility second, family third, sobriety, and then baseball. We got that skewed in our country. We got sport at the top. We did a study about five, six years ago of how the kids are coming to us, and I know you're seeing this too. I heard some of the good coaches up here talking a minute ago, especially with the parents. See, a kid's a kite. He can't soar unless he has turbulence. What's the parents doing today? They take all the turbulence out of the life of their child. They think that's I love you. Then they wonder why he can't get off the ground. You see? So this is why we're having trouble as coaches. Also, society's lying to our, our, our boys. They're telling them that they can do everything fast and easy and with no discipline. That's a lie. They're coming to us as coaches. We're selling them on what? Hard work and discipline. They don't want to be sold on that. Corporate America's telling them, I can get on the five-minute ab roller and get abs in five minutes. Why do I have to work out hard? But they're being lied to. They're being lied to. You've got to get rid of the myth when they come play for you. You've got to get rid of the myth. They've been lied to before they get to you. It's a lie. Nothing happens fast and easy with no discipline. Let's look at select baseball today. It's a fractured model, right? The coaches were very kind up here. I think the words they were using, uh, I'm not going to use them because we're on, we're on the air. But select baseball is a fractured model. My wife does not want me to die of high blood pressure, so I'm going to talk about it just for a second. But, but select baseball is a fractured model. It's play heavy and skill weak. That's bad. Kids are playing a 1,000 games in a summer, and they don't even have the skill to play in one game, but they're playing in a 1,000 games with bad skill. So this is why 48% of Major League Baseball is from a foreign country, and where they're coming in from, there's no select baseball. If we're so smart, I mean, I'd love to be taken over by the Russians with some kind of bat, with some kind of technology, jet fighter material or something, but we're getting taken over by people that don't even have a glove. They don't have a bat. I'll tell you what they got. They got the gift of inconvenience. That's what they got. I went to a ballpark one night, saw dad come in. This kid, nine years old, he's texting on the phone. His daddy, his old man's carrying his bat bag for him. Now think about that. We think our, our priorities are straight. Then the Cubans are going to take a raft, get on a raft, and get over here and fight sharks. Who you think is going to get the job? That little dude, Texan, with his old man, carrying his bat bag? There's no way. 
And for select baseball, you see it the way the players are coming to you. I see the way we're getting them right now, right? Everything's guaranteed. You're guaranteed to get three jerseys. You're guaranteed to get an Oakley contract. You're guaranteed to get a Marucci bat. You're guaranteed to get all this stuff. We're going to go play down in Disney this weekend. Guaranteed six games. They go down there, and guess what happens? They get their, their teeth kicked in on Friday twice, right? Then they go to Waterworld that night. Saturday, they go back. They get their teeth kicked in again, what's left of the teeth from the day before, right? Then they go to the zoo. Sunday, they got one tooth left. They get it knocked out of their mouth on Sunday because they got guaranteed six games. Then they go see Mickey Mouse and Goofy. They come home on Monday. Dude got his teeth kicked in, lost six times. Guy walks up to him at school and says, hey, man, how'd y'all do this weekend? He utters the words, I had a great weekend. Now think about that. Dude lost six games, got his teeth kicked out of his mouth, and he's uttering the words, I had a great weekend. And this is why we can't find guys that want to throw down, guys that want to play with their hair on fire, guys that want to compete. They lost the art of competing. Why? Because everything's given to them, everything's guaranteed. We're fighting that as coaches. Another thing we saw in that five-year study I did was lack of leadership. Can't find leaders. You're probably leaderless, probably looking for a leader. We've got 18,000 books in print on leadership, but we can't find a leader because leadership's confusing. So you know what we've done five years ago? We stopped practicing one day a week, either on Mondays, we call it Motivational Mondays, or we stop practicing on a Tuesday uh, or Wednesday, and we'll call it a Real Life Wednesday or Wisdom, Wisdom Wednesdays. They've practiced enough baseball. What we started doing is working on them, because they're the problem. It's not baseball. They're the problem, not baseball. They've played enough baseball. Problem is they don't understand how to be a leader, and they don't want to compete. So we've had to change some parameters. One of the things we've got to do now is teach leadership. Can't send a duck to leader, uh, Eagle School. These are the two big things that we want to try to get them to understand. You've got to know the way. You've got to be willing to go the way. And then you can show somebody the way. The problem in our country, everybody want to skip, skips number two. They know the way, but they don't want to go the way. But they want to show people the way. You can't do that as a leader. If you're going to be the leader of your team, I tell this to parents all the time, that our players, you can't become a father or a parent and lay your life if it's in disarray over your fam, your children, expect your children to make it. It's not gonna happen. You gotta get your house in order. You can't lay your disarrayed life over your team and expect your team to be, have it together. It's impossible. Everybody wants to work on everybody around them. Nobody wants to work on themselves. And so we wanna teach them that not only do they have to know the way, they gotta be willing to go the way and then they can show somebody the way. We also want to make sure they hit the 360 level of a leader. They serve the person above them, they share with the person on the side of them, and they lift up the person below you. What's the biggest problem on your team? They don't want to serve you, okay? Because they got no respect for authority. You're not their select coach. They all have an attorney by the time they six. You tell them we're gonna run 10 laps today. They call their attorney to see if they have to run those laps, or if you can legally move him from shortstop to left field. So you have to be prepared for all that today, right? Then we want them to share with the person on the side of them and then lift up the person below them, okay? Then we get into leadership myths. I'm not gonna cover them today, but this is in one of our motivational Mondays. We have to teach leadership. Guys, you have to teach it. Remember this, <coughs> this, this is a misnomer. When somebody says, put your kid in sport, he's gonna gain character and leadership out of playing the sport, that's a lie. There's only one way your players will get character and leadership. Same thing with your children, is if you as a father teach it and model it. That's it. I hate when coaches call me and say, boy, coach, we're just leaderless. Well, go home and look in the mirror. What's your problem? You're the leader. Stop going to practice every day hollering, boy, we lack leadership, we lack leadership. You're gonna holler that to you blue in the face. They're not coming to you a leader anymore. They don't understand what a leader is. Society has lied to them even on what a man is. Heck, we got shows now where a guy can try out 20 women on TV and then pick one, right? That's a great show for a boy, isn't it? You can go ahead and treat women like a used car lot. If you don't like her, bring her back. But that's what's happening to boys. And we're the stopgap, man. We're, we're, we're coaches, we're the stopgap. We have to show him what a man really is. We have to teach him what a man is. So this is leadership myths we go through. Next, here's the big lie. If you look at magazines at Walmart or anywhere on TV, look how many times you see in just 10 minutes. Easy, fast, overnight. That's what's being pounded to them every day in their phone, okay? So they're coming to you thinking they're gonna be able to do something fast and easy with no discipline. We gotta get that out of their head and make sure that this is a lie. 
Why do you see it more on women's magazines than you do men's magazines? Because as men, we bought born with a disease called pride. We can be 300 pounds overweight. We get in the mirror and we go, hey, I look good today. I look good today. But women, women are never satisfied with the way they look. So corporate America is always attacking them. Drop, drop 10 dress sizes overnight by drinking this punch. See, corporate America wants your player to believe if he takes this, drinks this, wears this, buys this, he'll become this. That's a lie. That's a lie. These are want ads. They didn't come out very good, but these are want ads that we show them in a, in a slide presentation that we cut out of the paper. In there is clean driving record, must pass a drug test, team leader, energetic. So we ask them to look up there and look at all of these key words up there Then that show me where does it say you have to be a baseball player. I mean, that's, that's not what corporate America is looking for. But as a coach, we can give them the skills they need to go get that job. Look at society today, okay? We're so much smarter, but we know less. We're so much faster, but we're going nowhere. We can build strong homes. We got so many sick ones. We can conquer space, but we can't conquer our bad habits. We can save the whale, but we're killing our children. We had a lady the other day threw her child out of the car window on the interstate. We got fastest communication today, but with qualities at an all-time low. We should be making technology our slave, but we got so many people enslaved by technology. We should be living above the influence, but we got so many people under the influence. We should be consumers, but we're being consumed. Our kids want to be entertained today instead of being engaged in something. I tell my players every day, when you come here and play for me, man, I'm no circus clown. You want to be entertained? You go across the street to the Cajun Dome where the circus comes to town, and somebody might make you feel good and make you laugh. I'm, I'm not no circus clown. I'm not going to be David Copperfield today. It's not my job to entertain you. But that's our problem with them today is because they want to be entertained because they're being entertained in their hand all day long. 74% of kids cheat in college today. So they said, okay, if cheating is so high today, what are the, which ones are the degrees they're cheating in the most? Business and engineering. We've seen all the Ponzi scams. 25% of every person that logs onto a computer today goes to a pornographic site. 56% of all divorces today are caused by pornography. One in two marriages today end in divorce or separation, but with real prayer, only one in 2,000 in divorce. 51% of people 18 or older get engaged today or married versus living together, down from 81%. We're in the richest generation ever, but 73% of people don't like their life. Since 1950, suicide is up 5,000%, up 1,000% per decade. Think about that for a minute, man. Suicide, up 5,000%. Every addiction's at an all-time high today. As we sit here this morning, sex addiction, drug addiction, alcohol addiction, food addiction, video game addiction. I had a player come in one time and say, Coach, I'm suffering from video addiction. I said, what the hell is that? He said, I play video games all day and I, night and I sleep during the day. I said, unplug the damn thing. I mean, pretty simple to me. What do you mean a video addiction? Every addiction's at an all-time high today. As we sit here today, every, we have shows about addiction today, all right? Fathers spend less than 30 minutes per, per day in positive self-talk with their spouse and their children. Kids watch 55 hours of TV today per week and play 13 hours of video games. There was 569 variations of the F word in the Wolf of Wall Street. I don't think you need to be using that word in practice. Not if you're a leader. Not if you're teaching him how to be a servant leader. Tell him just to go watch the Wall Street movie, man. They had 569 variations of the F word. A child will see 200,000 acts of violence and 16,000 murders by the time he's 18. 100,000 kids per day miss school because of abuse or bullying. Too many parents today let their kids teach them. That's what you're going through. That's what you're fighting. The kids teaching them, the parents. God sent us children to be taught. That, that's us. That's us as coaches, us as men. He's, 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 in, he's hoping that we teach this boy how to become a man. A man don't hit a woman. A man doesn't try out a woman and bring her back to the used car lot. Just doesn't. Here's called the basis of life. I don't know why the, the videos aren't, 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 aren't clear for you, but uh, this is the basis of life right here. This is how a boy separates and becomes a man. One, A, a call to adventure. B, a separation from family. Time of testing, physically, ethically, morally, and relationally. And then he's got to get instruction from a mentor. That mentor is us as coaches. 
we the ones that have to mentor him. We talk to our players about this all the time. We all start out at home in our life. We're happy. We know what's right. We know right from wrong. We start out to first base. We get there about 13, 14, 15 years old. We're still close to home, only 90 feet away. Then we get to second base. By the time we're about 15, 16, into our early 20s, now we're the furthest away from home we've ever been in our life. That kid's taking his lead. He's got the second baseman trying to deceive him. He's got the shortstop trying to deceive him. He's got the catcher and the pitcher trying to deceive him. And then he's looking into who? A coach. He's looking into a coach. He wants that coach to ultimately wave him around third and get him back home. And ultimately, that's what we're trying to do in our own life. We're being deceived over and over and over, not by the pitcher, but by the devil. And we want to get back home. We're trying to get him back home. He's counting on you. He's looking into the third base coach to wave him around third and to get him ultimately back home. They did a survey. They asked the parents, what are your five fears when, when every kid separate when your child goes to play college baseball? They said drugs, alcohol, sex, negative peer pressure, balance in academics and athletics. Then they asked the kid, what's your five reasons for playing baseball? He said fun, playing time, scholarship, attention, and the Major League Baseball draft. So there's a disconnect there between what the parents are concerned with that they want him to get out of playing for you and what he wants to get by playing baseball. We as a coach have to connect those two. We have to connect them. We do this through AIT equals AC as part of our program. It's worn on their bracelets. Um, the A is attitude, a supreme confidence in your ability to win at anything or in any situation. Others hope we expect. See, if I hope the pizza gets here at 2 and it doesn't, I'm not that mad. But boy, if I expect the pizza to be here at 2 and it's not, now nah, I'm really mad. So there's a difference between hope and expectation. Next is approach. What's your duty, job, or function any given time within the confines of the pack or our team? Who are you? How do you go about your business and what can I do to help us win a championship? Intensity is the next one in AIT. It's a burning excitement for the challenge of competition. It's how we play the game. It's our best tool. It allows us to overachieve. This is one of our problems today in our country. I go watch a select baseball game. It takes an hour and a half for a team to get on and off the field. They're cool. You can't find anybody that hits the field anymore. You can't find people that want to play with their hair on fire because intensity, it's your biggest tool. It allows you to overachieve. Should I have won 58 games last year, be two wins off the record, NCAA record at our size school? Probably not. But I can tell you this, passion out does logic. You put good men in a good organization, the organization is going to be good. You put bad men in an organization, expect the organization to be good, won't be good. Toughness, the, the T and AIT. I know you have days like this, but here's the thing about toughness. Your attitude, your approach, and intensity in the midst of adversity. Those are the three. This is the toughest one for our players to get. Each week we have a different week. Week one's attitude. Next week it's, it's approach. Next week it's intensity. The next week it's toughness. This is the toughest one for them to get because everybody's got a great attitude, approach, and intensity. But when they get in adversity, it changes. It changes. If you have both of those, we found out that you have a byproduct off of that. It's called an aggressive competitor, which is what you're trying to strive for. Because I know, I've, I know this with kids today, they don't want to throw down anymore, they don't want to compete, they want to lawyer up. I mean, it's, it's, it's amazing because, again, if, if you were going to get a medal and you finished in 12th place in the race, you wouldn't run either. That's what's happening to them. They're not running. Everything's guaranteed for them until they get to you. Think about the select model, how fractured it is. They, they, don't, they call your house, right? A guy called my house one day for my son as a pitcher and said, he takes the phone call, he comes give it to me, he says, Dad, there's a guy on the phone. He wants me to go pitch for his team. If we uh, win, we're going to get a watch and a ring. So I said, okay. He said, let me have the phone. You go in the back room. I don't want you to hear what I'm going to tell this guy. So I get on the phone. I said, sir, I really appreciate you calling my house for my son to be a pitcher. We're really humbled by that. But I'm going to explain something to you. I live in a little town called Crowley, Louisiana. We have a Walmart. I can take Austin right now to the Walmart and get him a ring or a watch at the jewelry counter. I don't need you selling my kid on no jewelry, man. Why don't you tell him that he's going to tuck his shirt in? Why don't you tell him he's not going to talk back to an umpire on this team? Why don't you tell him we're going to get on and off the field? Why don't you tell him I'm not guaranteeing you nothing but a lot of hard work? Why don't you tell him if he doesn't know where his face is, how to wear his hat? Why don't you teach him some things and then you know what, we'll play for you. But why am I going to play for you when you're selling my kid on jewelry? My kid don't need no damn jewelry. 
But that's what we're doing underneath us to them, okay? That's what's being done. So an aggressor, the player that plays the game with the freedom, the fear, consequent, this player plays to win. At the end of each season, we, the team votes out who had the best attitude. We put them into a hall of AIT equals AC Hall of Fame. So this is Mike Strentz. He's playing with the Angels now. I, actually, um, got married last night. So you see, now, now I have to kick in. I got to hope he don't punch his wife. I got to hope he can be true to her. I hope he's learned in three years with us how not to put his hands on her, how not to try her out, how to be true to her because he went down the aisle and she said, I do, I do means trust. Can he, can he do that? Can he really be a man? Because ultimately, that's what's gonna make or break him, not how good of a catcher he is for the Angels. This is my son, he was voted competitor, the player that hates losing more than he enjoys winning. We were nicknamed the Grinders. This is what their motto is, just for you to know. The G stands for God comes first. The R stands for remain humble, no ego. Our players understand that ego stands for edging God out. See, God gives us two gifts in our life. The first one, it's a universal gift. We all have it. It's the ability to make a difference in somebody else's life. It doesn't take no talent to do that. We want our players to hold the door open for a teacher, hold the door open for somebody when they head to the classroom because we want them to understand that God gave you a gift to make a difference in somebody else's life. It's our second gift as men that gets us all in trouble. He gave us a unique gift. My gift, you don't have. Your gift, I don't have. He allows us to make money with that gift. And this is where the trouble comes in. We're gonna get good at that second gift. We're gonna make money at it. We're gonna get famous for it, see? And then we get in trouble because we don't give the glory back to him. He gave us that gift to become great, to have a platform. Like I told my son, if you make it to the angels, you get to the big leagues, that's God giving you a platform. Now what are you gonna do with that platform when you get it? Are you gonna sit down where it's safe and not, not, not even mention his name when yet the man died for you? They didn't throw him a banquet that night. He died a thief's death for me. And I'm gonna get good at what I do and get invited here to speak to you and not whisper his name that's, 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 that's uncomprehensible to me. Invest in your team. Never give up. Doubt is your enemy. Embrace the suck. Respect your opponent and stay focused. Here's our hurdles that we go. I'm not going to go over them all, but I just wanted to show you this is one of our motivational Mondays, okay? It's the 13 hurdles in life that's going to prevent him from being successful. And if he can't get over any of these hurdles, then he's never going to make it in life. The first one we cover with him is sin. Sin's what you did, it's not who you are. That's, that's the biggest problem. We, we all gravel with that, right? We made a mistake along the way, and then all of a sudden now, that mistake's gonna become who we are. It doesn't have to be that way. What you did should not be who you are. It shouldn't. But one of your kids that come to you, you need to understand that, because he made, made, maybe he's made a grave mistake already, and now he thinks that, man, that mistake, now that's who I am. That's not true. That's not true. That's why the alcoholic, the stripper, the drug addict, we all have a chance with Christ because what we do should not become who we are. And that's our biggest trouble in life is that what we do starts to become who we are. I am a baseball coach. That is it. But it's not who I am. Unequivocally. I don't want to be glorified. I don't want somebody thinking I'm great. I'm nothing. I'm an old boy from Crowley with a health and pee degree. I'm no better than you. No better than you. I don't want to be glorified. I want to glorify somebody that deserves to be glorified. Number two, temptation. That's when it gets them in trouble right now, man. You got to explain to them they got a bad wolf and a good wolf in them. Okay? You can't kill the bad wolf. You got it in you too. We can't kill our bad wolf. My truck wants to turn into the strip club. My, 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 I'm not immune from nothing, man. I'm not immune from anything. But the bottom line is I got a bad wolf and a good wolf in me. I know this, if I starve the bad wolf, my good wolf's gonna get bigger. The problem with kids, they run with a bad group of kids, guess what they do? Those kids feed their bad wolf. Then they come back to you, and you gotta try to kill that bad wolf. Number three, addiction. An addiction is nothing but a temporary fix to a permanent solution, man. You look at addiction today, they did a study a while back, they found out that 95% of the time, two things that an addict is suffering from, a spiritual deficiency in their life. They can't tell you the last time they've been to church or a family deficiency in their life. So it's real simple, man. They did a study. 
They show that the addict can get off from being an addict if he's got a spiritual life and a family life. So what should we be doing as coaches? Keep these kids connected to God and family. But yet, you know what we do in our schools? We're running God out. We're running him out. And yet, the study shows right there. Number four, discouragement. Your players are going to get discouraged. Man, you're going to get discouraged. Remember, the devil can only do his work if you're discouraged. Number five, rejection. It's our biggest problem in life, okay? We all search for acceptance and happiness. This is what gets us in trouble as men. This is what gets your player in trouble. He's searching for acceptance and happiness. We don't, none of you woke up, I didn't wake up this morning, you didn't wake up this morning and go, you know what I'm going to do today? I'm going to make myself be miserable all day. We don't do that. We search for acceptance, we search for happiness. So this is what gets us in trouble because corporate America starts to sell us on what pleasure is versus happiness. This is where the trouble comes in. Pleasure versus happiness. You have to teach them that. Critics, they don't build statues for critics. One year, they, early in my career, they were hoping I wouldn't leave. Late in my career, they hope I hurry up and go. One year, I'm too fat. One year, I'm too skinny. One year, we got the wrong colored hats. That's what's causing us to lose. Coach said that earlier. The more success you get, the more critics you get. But let me tell you this about a critic. They don't build a statue for a critic. When you go out in front of Dodger Stadium and you see Jackie Robinson up there, they, don't, they, they didn't build a statue of the dude that was hollering at him about the race of his color or anything. They didn't build a statue of that dude. They don't build statues for critics. So, so, so don't worry about the critic. Don't worry about him. They're not going to build a statue of him at your field anyway. Make them build a statue of you at your field, the guy that handled the critic. Number seven, fear. This is the biggest one that gets us in trouble, especially in baseball. You're going to fight it with your players. Fear. God said in the Old Testament and the New Testament over a thousand times, do not be afraid. Why he didn't say it one time, why he didn't say it two times, why he didn't say it three times, because he knew fear would be our biggest crippler in life. Fear is our biggest crippler. Should I steal second? Should I take that new job? Should I stand up here and speak, man? What am I, what, am I a little worried maybe if they, they hate me because I'm using the word God up here? I mean, fear. You can't let fear shackle you. You can't let it shackle you. I think this message needs to get out or it wouldn't have went from Texas to Tennessee to Mississippi to here. I just think there's not enough people that, 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 that are brave enough to get up and do it. They're not going to cut Michael Jordan open one day or a Navy SEAL and go, there it is, man. I knew it. He's got an extra gene. People that have courage don't have no extra gene and no difference in you. The difference is, are you going to sit down when it's time to stand up? I mean, that's, that's, that's the question. I want my players to be able to stand up when it's time to stand up and not just sit down. I still want them to flip the tractor tire. I still want them to try to get a Major League Baseball contract. Heck, we're ranked sixth in the country right now. I care about baseball. I really do. But I'm not going to use them to win. Because ultimately, down in life, they won't win. And what are we in this for? You know how they should judge coaches? They ought to come get us, go back, look at all of our players, see who's true to their wife, see who's not an addict, and then rearrange coaches. Failure. Man, huh, our game's full of this. Just, just make sure, man, that we never win or lose. W stands for win for us. L stands for learn. We never use the word lose. Only time we lose is when we fail to learn. Number eight, courage. Nobody has an extra gene. Ten, change. We cannot become, he cannot become who God intended him to be without with him remaining the same. And that's your biggest fight with a player, right? He doesn't want to change. You got to get him to understand that the person he is right now, that's not the person God intended him to be. He's got to change. He's got to grow so he doesn't fight you when it comes to, to, to change. A journey towards something is actually a journey away from something. Number 11, convenience. This is what's got us in our country today. 48% of Major League Baseball is from a foreign country, and it's growing because they come from inconvenience. We've got a pack of Skittles that hangs in our locker room bulletin board. It's push pinned up there because I tell them the story all the time. If I go to the Bronx and I go get me a little nine-year-old boy out of the Bronx and I go to the richest place in our town and I get me another nine-year-old little boy and I put them in our locker room and I throw that pack of Skittles on the ground and I say, y'all go get them. Guess who's getting them Skittles? That guy from the Bronx. He ain't got no backup plan. He has to get them Skittles. The other one, he comes from privilege. I don't need it. Mommy and daddy will buy me some. You see it all the time, right? Mommy and daddy running in the third inning and give him a power raid because he's a little hot in the third inning of a game, man. Big lie. It's going to be fast and easy with no discipline. 
Had them go drink out of the water hose. Number 12, you. That's going to be their biggest opponent is them. It's going to be your biggest opponent. My wife saved my life in 1988. I'm ever indebted to her. She was supposed to ride with me today, but she had the flu. Somebody's got to save us from us, man. But as a man, we're born with pride. We think we're going to save ourselves. You the one that's going to save your players. They need you to save them from them. They're being glorified, especially your greatest athlete. He's already walking around. When I go into a junior high, man, I can circle the dude that's in trouble. Junior high guy. He's already living out the lives of a man. They're glorifying him. He's a big running back at the junior high. He's the guy running women. Best book you'll ever read, if you want to jot it down, Joe Ehrman, Inside Out Coaching. Greatest book. They ought to make that mandatory read before you ever touch a child. Because he tells you that you've got to fix you before you can go fix anybody else. We're real good at trying to fix other people. We're not real good at fixing ourselves. The last one, i got one minute left on the card. The last one is significance, man. Trying to get them to understand who are they, where are they, what's this world about. And remember this, man, in closing, what will you say when God asks you to give your account of your stewardship and your discipleship? He's going to cross your path one day, okay? And he's going to ask you, I'm just, I'm just simulating this, I'm, I'm, I'm worried about me. I hope I even get that chance, but I, think this, I don't think this is how the conversation can go. I walk up on him, he says, Tony, I sent you 600 boys, over 600 boys. What'd you do with them? Did you talk to them about me? Did you expose them to me? I don't think I'm going to be able to tell him, gee, let me tell you something, man. I got a thousand wins, man. I'm the winningest coach in UL's history. I've been to Omaha. I really don't think that's the answer he's looking for. I really don't. But he's going to ask me, what did you do with those 600 boys? Did you help them become servant leaders? Did you teach him what a real man is? I don't think I can say, God, I, I swear I made one throw a better slider. I don't think that's the answer he's looking for. Okay? Remember this, if you remember one thing today. A good coach makes a boy a better baseball player. A great coach makes a boy a better man. Be a great coach. Thank you. God bless you.